Thank you for downloading this podcast from Digital Mindfulness. I'm Lawrence Ampofo, and this is episode number 22. Hello and welcome to the Digital Mindfulness Podcast, where each week we speak with experts who are at the cutting edge of humanising our digital experiences and interactions in digitised society. In this episode, I speak with Nima Maraveji. Nima is the Director of the Calming Technology Lab at Stanford University and focuses on how digital devices can be used to mitigate acute and chronic stress. Nima is also the founder and chief product officer at Spire, a wearable technology company that tracks and influences human physical and mental well-being. Remember, if you like what we're doing here, please subscribe to us on iTunes or Stitcher and to our email community where you'll have access to exclusive content that we don't share on the podcast or on the website. I hope you enjoy this episode with Nima Moravaji. So Nima, thank you so much for joining us today on Digital Mindfulness. Um, I really can't wait to talk to you a bit more about Calm Technology and the things that you're doing at Spire. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this conversation as well, Lawrence. Thanks for having me. So Nima, to kick us off, I'm wondering if you can share with me and the audience a little bit about yourself. How did you come to be working on Calming Technology and eventually Spire? Well, I, I'm trained as a computer scientist turned uh, human-computer interaction researcher. So I studied uh, and continue to study you know, the intersection between computer science, product design, as well as psychology, and now more so health and physiology. So it's my work is at the, the intersection of those fields and specifically I focus on our state of mind. I focus on stress, focus, calm, and and how the, the state of mind interacts with our um, interacts with our technology and our use of technology, and how those products and those interactions can be intentionally and consciously constructed to have uh, Im- impact on us that is the way we want it to be. So Nima, can you tell us a little bit more now about Spire? What is it that you're doing there with Spire? And more specifically, what is calming technology and why is that important? Well, you know, when I was uh, doing my graduate research at Stanford, I was working on learning. And one of the things that occurred is that I began working uh, within the context of learning, I started thinking about behaviors and learned behaviors. And that's when I met B.J. Fogg and took his class and um, noticed that a lot of the behaviors that we were working on were, you know, eating, sleeping, walking, and, and those are crucial. Uh, but I personally felt that there was, you know, there's this kind of other behavior that is also so important, which is how we carry ourselves, how we approach a situation, how we feel internally, and um, the, our clarity of mind. And, and so I began to work on that. And the way that I encapsulated it was, look, you know, we all know that there are times that we feel more, that we perform better, right? And, and, and I, I called it a, a calm, a calm state of mind. Uh, you know, it's been called flow, it's been called a million things. But the reason I just kind of simplify it, it says, look, when, when people are calm, meaning not, not that they're relaxed, but they're calm, they don't have anxiety, uh, like a quarterback in the pocket uh, about to throw a ball or a, a soccer player about to, to uh, kick a penalty kick, I mean, they don't want to be relaxed, but they certainly would benefit from being calm uh, where their mind isn't driving them all over the place so they, to the point where they can't focus and, and perform. Uh, this state of calm is something that is, is something that we, can, we have agency over. And um, 
so when we started thinking about uh, my background being in product design and technology, it was like, okay, well, this is clearly really important around you know having more calm in our day, more clarity uh, and confidence and sense of control in our day. This is clearly important. It influences so many of these behaviors. It influences what we eat. It influences how we feel before we go to sleep and when we decide to go to sleep or um, exercise, right? So it, it kind of became what I call this root behavior um, that would kind of influence so many of these other behaviors. But, it, but it's also very vague, right? I mean, how do you make tangible this, this ephemeral state of mind? So I began to, to think more about this general topic. And, um, and the problem came to be, you know, with BJ, one of the great things about his work is that he focuses a lot on taking – these outcomes and, and simplifying them, boiling them down to uh, baby steps. You know, what, what are the simplest behaviors that matter? And focus on that. And that's, a, that's such a tremendous tool. Um, and so my work began to focus on that. What are the simplest behaviors that matters when it comes to uh, cultivating greater calm in your mind, greater clarity and uh, less anxiety? And um, that turned into a whole research program um, within calming technology that focused on breathing. And the reason that we did that is, is you know, if you, th- if you think about taking something abstract and making it concrete, you, you know, the more concrete, the better, the more uh, actionable, the better, right? So uh, when it comes to behavior change, if you want to create a habit for someone that they floss every night. This is a great example that BJ uses. It's like, okay, well, just put the floss next to the toothbrush. I mean, that's a very tangible thing. Uh, and then the next one might be just to floss one tooth, right? So these are just, it's, it's about, it's a, you know, you, you think about this thing, a habit. It's so, it's so um, aspirational and puts distance between you and, and, what it, and, and that habit. But if you boil it down to its, to its most concrete elements, it becomes approachable. Uh, so, so when we looked at the, the physiology and the mechanics around surrounding the state of mind, uh, there's so many things that are occurring when we're stressed, when we're anxious, when we're feeling calm and focused. There's a lot of things that happen in the body and, and in, our, in our physiology, our neurophysiology. That's great. But what is the equivalent of putting the floss next to the toothbrush? You know, what's the equivalent of flossing one tooth? What's the simplest behavior that matters? And what it came down to is the breathing, respiration, is the only physiological change that occurs as the mind, as the mind changes and evolves. It's the only, it's only in the bioindicator that changes that you have conscious control over. Does that make sense? So the, there's a lot of things that are happening in our, in our bodies. You know, hormones are being dumped into our bloodstream, our heart rate changes, sweat, pupil dilation, clenching of muscles. There's a lot of things, but breathing is, is, is bi-directional. You, know, you, can, you can actually change it and it goes in and changes your nervous system directly. So that, if you're thinking about it from a product feedback perspective, which is where I was coming from. It's like, well, the purpose of this whole exercise is to think about feedback. You give people feedback about things that they can easily control. That, 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 that was the kind of very different way of looking at the problem rather than just monitoring and measuring the state of mind. We were looking to influence it, monitor it and influence it. And so as a result, we, we said, look, if we give people the simplest feedback, it's not about um, measuring every single breath in the most accurate possible way because that would require putting a, a, something around your mouth and your nose and just – you know, that's, that's about tracking. The goal is not tracking. The goal is to get to that SBTM, that simplest behavior that matters, you know, at the right time. So it's, it's the right trigger, the right, S, uh, sorry, the, the right behavior, the SBTM, which is that simplest behavior that matters. And, and the trigger, which is another thing I learned from BJ, the trigger being ideal or, you know, at the right time in the right way. And that, that combination um, is what led us to this whole research program around sensing the breathing, giving feedback to, to in, in places that people uh, can use it 
in fact, we started doing research. We, we put these bands around people's abdominal cavities uh, to sense the, sense the respiration. And we, would, we had a wire going to the computer. And then we would put it, um, the feedback up in the system tray and near the time of your, of your Mac desktop and your laptop. So you'd have the time there and then you'd have some feedback about your breathing there. And that was, that was very early. That was like the first experiments that we were doing around giving people this, this feedback. And we've, we learned some really interesting things. I mean, we learned that people, if you, um, first of all, people can regulate their breathing without distracting them from their task that's crucial if you think about that right so so if you do a cognitive task you have people do um something very cognitively intense so you know if, if you're let's say you're working at the computer and you're, you're working on a, on a spreadsheet or you're programming or you're working on a document or you're emailing um you know you, you might think well you know biofeedback's great but it's not really going to be that useful because I don't want to stop what I'm doing. You know, it, it, it's, it's not going to be that, it's not going to be integrated into my day. I mean, I, great, when I, when I go and do a biofeedback exercise, that's great, but I'm not going to do it because I want to get my work done and I'm excited about what I'm doing and I don't want to, I don't have the discipline to stop and go do this exercise. So that really led to um, biofeedback just kind of being relegated to this this very high touch, you know, go and do a session and like, it's useful. It's very useful. It's very powerful, but it, it wasn't creeping into the daily life. It wasn't part of our, our, our daily experience. Um, and I, and my argument, my hypothesis is that was that, um, that's because we're requiring too much. We're not giving people, um, the simplest behavior that matters. We're giving them this whole big interface to, to do everything and, and assuming that they're going to have the attention and time to, to focus on just that. But, but if we change that, if we focus on the, the, the S part of SBTM, the simplest, then you, say, then you say to people, look, I'm here to serve you, you know, not I want you to do what I think is best, the, 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 the training that I think is best. And it's actually like what works for you. Well, what works for people is something that fits into their lifestyles. And we all know that you know, people are working. There's a lot of the engaging, exciting things happening that people want to be involved in. But they want to have greater you know, regulation and greater balance and uh, awareness at the same time. So it's not about, well, no, 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 you, you shouldn't do that. Go and do this instead. It's like, okay, yeah, you, you, can, you can do that. You can be engaged. You can be in the zone there and stay aware. And so what we started doing is putting subtle feedback on the screen and finding that, in fact, it does change the way people breathe significantly and it doesn't lower their performance on these cognitively demanding tasks. And that was like, hey, this is really powerful. This is a, a new form of what you might call biofeedback. I mean, um, more like a pedometer and less of a, 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 like a therapy session, right? It's just, it's just a little different. I think it's really interesting that you say that because for thousands of years, the religious and spiritual people have been talking about how important it is to gain control and to regulate one's breathing. But now the science is really backing up quantitatively just how important this is for people. So I guess what I'm really wondering now is if you can share with us, what are some of the real scientific um, effects that controlling one's breathing has on us? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, I, when I first started this research, I too thought that, you know, this was something I had, you know, I had experience with meditation, yoga. Um, I, I had some practice with understanding the breath and, and how it was more than meets the eye. And so I thought that I was doing this work of, you know, taking what was from the East and bringing it to the West. And I kind of was like, oh, that's, that's pretty cool. But then I started doing, this, this was, you know, research. And so I started researching the topic and it turns out that that actually isn't true. Uh, in fact, that the West has known about this for a very, very long time from 
uh, from Greek philosophers to uh, German and Swiss philosophers. Freud wrote about the breath all the time, not all the time, but he wrote about it, and, and it's linked with emotions. Um, so many Western philosophers understood this. It's pretty fascinating, and um, Russia had a lot of a lot of um, research into the breath because of their space program. Um, so they were they 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 had worked on it as well. So there there was a there, there has been a lot of work, um, but it um, I think actually what was keeping it from being more impactful was this this paradigm of you got to go in and do this heavy handed session, you know, and that's when you're going to that's when you're, that's how you're going to use the breath rather than um, hey you know. When it matters, when you notice it, do something about it. Don't make it a big deal. You know, like you don't have to like stop and kind of go and get really in a deeply calm state all the time. That that that's certainly helpful, and there's a time for that. But there's just a time for a deep breath. You know, and it's it's in our it's in our vocabulary. It's in our vernacular um, for a reason, and it's not just our language. I mean, I've actually done so much interviewing of people from around the world and almost every culture that you look at they actually have a pretty interesting the breath is not just the breath you know in in, in i've never come across a culture that that's not the case and breath is is more than just respiration uh so so that's just like it's just very curious why uh, it hadn't been brought um into the into kind of daily life through technology before but that's you know whatever that's just kind of what research is and it was also the time when when bluetooth was emerging and personal phones mobile phones were emerging uh sensors were getting a little cut so we were the first people that then um you know put your breathing into your phone in real time as you were going about your day that was that was also one of the f- first things that uh, we were able to do which was just fascinating, and I and I remember vividly the first day that I was working in a cafe, and I had this band around my whole abdomen, and I was just, you know, I was like, yeah, this is great, you know, this is going to be really useful because people just wearing this band, look at all the benefit you can get from it. It's totally worth it, you know, to wear this band around your abdomen. And so I got the feedback when I was working on this document, and I bu- my phone buzzed, and I just looked at it. I thought it was a text message. I kind of looked at it, and it. It said, you know, it was this red line that we designed. You said, you're breathing significantly faster than you normally do. And I was just like, and I noticed that my breathing was just really shallow in my upper chest. And I was all clenched in my abdomen. I was like, and I was like, why am I so clenched up for no reason, really? And I so I just kind of like let it go. I gave myself a couple breaths, a couple seconds, just so I let the breath go lower. I didn't actually meditate or anything. I just let it go lower. And my whole disposition changed, and then, and then I returned to my work. So this is talking, you're talking like five, six seconds. And I returned to my work with a very different attitude. Uh, I was feeling rushed. I was feeling um, like I had, to, I had to do something rather than I get to do something. And, and, and approaching my work with interest and excitement and positive uh, and a positive mindset and and my writing changed and my reading changed and it was just like I was like wow that it's like a superpower it felt like a superpower because this very intimate thing which is how I was breathing and how it was making me feel uh, all of a sudden was out in my phone I was like whoa and then it came back and it allowed me to go back and that that to me was like this is really powerful now let's figure out how um how we can make this really uh, help people in daily life. And so one of the first things we did after that was figure out how we, it wasn't going to, people were not going to wear a band around their abdomen. They were not going to wear a really tight shirt all the time. It just, it just wasn't practical or desirable. Um, so we started doing a lot of research around sensing breathing in, in, a, in a very simple way. And that led to... Um, you know, spire as you see now, it just doesn't doesn't even touch your skin. It just kind of clips on your pants or to a bra, and it, it's this little stone that we created it as as a stone to be a natural object, a natural feeling object, reminding you of your own inner um, agency and, and power because it, it it is yours. Uh, the breath 
is yours. You don't even need a spire to, to, to sense your own breathing. And that's also really powerful and useful. And so, um, you know, you, you clip it there and it, it senses your breathing. It, it tells your phone. And, you know, we started then not just giving people feedback around what their breathing rate is because that um, that's quite – uh, quantitative and analytical, but rather interpreting that information, saying, "Well, it looks like you seem tense, uh, not necessarily stressed out, but you just seem tense. You're aroused in a way, physiologically aroused um, or calm." That's another state we have, and then we have this third state called focus. That uh, this is quite interesting. It, it is the state um, of being engrossed in something, uh, to where you, you you forget your yourself and you are um, in you're, you're totally engrossed in what you're doing what happens in that moment is that there's there's physiological changes that happen when your attention is sustained on something and you're not distracted you're not multitasking uh, but yet you're not anxious either it creates a different physiological state you know a, a flow has been associated with this um, peak performance and so on. And, and one of the things that happens is that your breathing becomes very regular. Uh, it's not necessarily slow. You're not relaxed. But it is that state of calm where you are, um, we call it focus because it comes to abstract in that situation, but it, it is focus. You're, you're, you're concentrating. Uh, and it's, it's rare. It's the rarest state to get in, inspired, but it is, um, it, it's just one of them. And so, so that's what Spire does. Mm, what you were just saying about Spire is really fascinating because it does take me back to a previous episode we did with Linda Stone who talks about email apnea, which is the term that she coined for people who hold their breath when they look at a particularly stressful email, whether that be positively or negatively stressful, and the effect that holding our breath has on us physio physiologically in that it puts our body into a fight or flight state. So... What I'm really thinking is that what you're doing with Spire now is going to be so important for people, particularly office workers who are constantly distracted by digital devices. Um, but yeah, learning how to regulate one's breathing, um, especially at those stressful moments, I think is going to be very important for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's, that's absolutely right. And, um, Linda's a, a good friend of ours, and we, we were, you know, one of the, I think we were the first place to actually demonstrate this, this phenomena, you know, apnea. I, you know, obviously, the apneic events where you're literally holding your breath, that's one extreme, but there, there's a continuum there of um, various stages of, of shallower breathing, of more um, rapid breathing. I mean, there's a whole continuum there. And, um, you know, there, there, is, there is also something to keep in mind, which is that, you know, stress, we, we are, I am not anti-stress, the company is not anti-stress, the actual, the field of inquiry is not anti-stress, because I, you know, in, in this research uh, around stress and, and the state of mind, and one thing that became really clear is that um, stress is part of life. I mean, if we didn't have stress, we would be dead, right? It, it, it compels us. It drives us to do things. It's a, it's a, it's a very ambiguous word, stress. Um, so now there are there are. It also is a continuum. Uh, chronic stress being very different from uh, acute stress, and also there's so, so many different uh, impacts of it. Uh, and even more specifically than that. Uh, stress can be very positive. I mean, it can it can drive us to 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 finish things. I mean, you know what you're doing with this project, this digital mindfulness project, bringing together these people and these um, concepts and resources, and putting together a bigger picture about how society can move forward with these tools and with this understanding. I mean, that there's no way that there's no stress involved in that, and <laughs> and that's okay. <laughs> you know, that's okay. Yeah. Um, you know, it really is okay, and 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 actually, it's exciting, and actually, we love it, and that's why amusement parks are so popular, and movies are so popular, and so, um, 
you know, I have done, I have been meditating a long time and I've done retreats and I've done all types of stuff and I have, you know, mindful friends and I'm in these circles and that circles and I have, I'm in circles that, you know, people are mindful, uh, but they don't meditate and they're not calm even. They're, they're quite engaged. They're excitable. They're, um, you know, they're, they're excited, enthusiastic. And so I, I think that's also really important. You know, when it comes to Spire, uh, we're we're very careful about that. It's it's a difficult thing to to um, balance, but just for example, I mean, the state of focus that I was talking about, or, or flow. I mean, it's it is a form of stress, right? I mean, you 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 are aroused, you are engaged, you are kind of doing. You're you, you're doing something. You're not passive, um, but it but it is without fear. It is without anxiety, and that that I think is more of the key. Not, not the relaxed the relaxation part. I think that stress is something that we're told widely in our societies that is something that we should keep away from. That is something that we should look to decrease because of the negative effects that we believe it has on us. But actually, I like what you're saying that stress. We should look at stress as maybe a tool. We should use it as something that can be beneficial at certain times, um, maybe when we need to get things done. Um, so I'm wondering whether a spire can be used to actually help people get into a state where they are ready to do um, things, where the stress, where their stress levels are maybe heightened a little bit more, maybe when people need to produce or do more, um, seeing as as you were saying that stress is actually not something to be feared. That's interesting. I mean, we, as of now, again, this is a relatively new product and there's, we're learning so much, but as of now, we, we don't explicitly uh, guide the user to induce, um, you know, a focus state or this kind of, this, that form of a stressful state. I mean, again, it's not, it's not stressful per se. It is, you know, it's an engaged state, I would call it. Uh, we don't we don't really do that because we because um, it's something that you you can't breathe into it. Do you know what I mean? Like it's it's very tricky to breathe into an engaged state. It's something you do with your mind. You couldn't breathe into a calm state, a relaxed state, um, where you're you're just you know down regulating your nervous system uh, because you you don't you know. That there are not enough pockets of time in your day where your nervous system can can rest and can recover. I mean, that that I think is the the, the common conception and the, the experience of what people are feeling. You know, because all these 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 little these little um, transitionary times in our day where we would you know go between an office and a car or uh, two different workspaces or. You know, something, all of those that where, where our nervous system could just kind of reset, those are, are, are all gone now um, because of phones and everything. And so people, people then feel like, well, there's no, there's no downtime. And so that's why now you have this growing interest in, I want to take that time. Even though I'm not going to get rid of my phone, I'm not going to, you know, that's just not going to happen. But I want to make sure I have those times. So actually, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, the sigh. A sigh, if you think about what a sigh is, when someone sighs, they, it is the body's way of naturally hitting a reset button. It, it, it kind of resets your breathing pattern, your breathing rate from being alive. It's going to go, <sighs> it slows it down. It slows it down naturally. So it's the body saying, you know, hey, I've had enough. I need, I need air. You know, I need to, you know, um, but... You know, you don't always want to wait till that happens, and a lot of times that doesn't happen. So, so we shouldn't think that when somebody sighs that they're bored or that they're being rude to us. But actually, what they're doing is resetting. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you had a reset there, did you? Okay. <laughs> well, you know, I, it's funny. I, if you think about why it has that connotation in our society, I think it's because you know someone is listening to you or, or you know, some, somebody's listening and they, they, kind of, they want to talk and they feel agitated that they can't talk or they don't want to listen to this or they're you know, kind of wanting something different. They're not just accepting and just being there in the moment. They're, they're resisting it. And so that, that's a clenching 
activity, that resistance. It's kind of like the abdomen clenches up, the shoulders clench up, your breathing speeds up or, or it, it holds. And then the body, it, it is in a subtle fight or flight system. And then it's a, you know, okay, I will, uh, let me submit a little bit and let me listen. Let me just actually like reset and see what, what is this person saying, you know? So that, that's, I think, more so what's happening when someone is sighing. But I know physiologically speaking, it is a reset. Why do you think we've been so good at developing technology that is so distracting and, as some people say, bad for us? Oh, I think it's just because people are usually creating technologies that, you know, if you look at, if you look at how technologies, the, the evolution of it, you know, originally they were tools and they were very passive, you know, they were just like, here's a palette of tools and you can kind of decide what you want to do with them. And that the whole, the whole paradigm was that of a tool maker, um, making the tools for a person to create things and do things. But that's totally different now where this medium is also where we take in things and we, you know, read things and make decisions and all that here. So now you have people that are creating technology that has, has a very different uh, intention and that is to get your attention, it is to main, keep your attention, it is to uh, influence you in very, you know, certain ways uh, for their advantage, right? I mean, we all know that and I, and I think that that that's not going to change. Um, I was reading your website and your quote about Paul Graham, and I think that's that's accurate. So, Nima, can you tell us whether Spire can be used or is being used to motivate other behaviors in addition to our breathing rate? So, first off, um, Spire is already being used for uh, behaviors other than breathing. Um, Specifically, uh, you know, take eating for example, and how people eat. Uh, it's already being used to help people eat in a way that's that's healthy for them, that they at a pace that they want to. Uh, if you can get a calm streak while you're eating, uh, that's very different than just kind of you know, scarfing it down. Uh, so you know, just taking just taking time to breathe. Have some rest in there while you're eating. That can change how you're eating. Or um, before you walk into the house, after a long day at the office, uh, just making sure that you you know you you had enough calm in the day, or you can uh, you're not in a stressful place before you walk in that door, bringing stress into the house. So um, it, you know, the breath is. When I say it's the root behavior, I, I mean that it, it can be taken on as a behavior in and of itself, but really what's what's so powerful is um, how it influences the other behaviors that we that we take on, how we do email. you know are we are we racing to get as much as well done as possible, or are we looking for the most important one, focusing on that, going to the next one? Uh, so so that's the first thing. also the, the second thing is that um, you know, Spire, the irony is not lost on me that we've created a technology to help people um, avoid stress and anxiety that oftentimes they blame on technology. Um, people, people bring that up regularly and say, well, how could you create a technology? We need less technology, right? Um, so, well, but so I don't really feel like that is a, uh, a valid argument because, look, I mean, Pandora's box is open. Right? We, we have the technology, and, and it's not bad, and it's not good. It helps us do so many things. Uh, so the question is, well, how do we also help uh, have it help us be living the way we want to live and, and, and approaching this technology and approaching this daily life the way we want to? Uh, I think it's, it's really a no-brainer that, of course, technology needs to go in this direction in fact, I think it's going to be a competitive advantage in the future. I think if you look at what Apple does, a lot of what they, a lot of their differentiation is on less. You know, it's on helping you feel, or at least claiming that it's going to help you feel calmer while you use it, uh, more in touch with your emotions while you use it, um, less of racing and, and panicking uh, while you use it. And, and they, they've done that a long time. So it's clear that that there is a. Um, uh, capitalistic uh, benefit to 
creating, you know, conscious computing or um, calming technology. It's just a matter of taking that to the next level. Uh, so, you know, one of the things, if you, if you think about what, what is stress inducing, there's actually a science around this and there's four characteristics of things that are stress inducing. One is that something that feels unpredictable or uncertain or unfamiliar in, in a way that you don't know how to deal with. So, so like unpredictability causes stress in people or the feeling of lost control. If you don't have control or things, this, this causes stress. Uh, something that you feel is going to cause damage to your your property or your things and like things that you own that causes stress. And the, and the final one is is some perception that you're being uh, threatened or evaluated. Uh, so your your character is being evaluated, judged, something like that. So th- those are those are the four fundamental uh, stressors. So it's actually fascinating if you think about it because normally we think of like, well, that's stressful, this is stressful, that's stressful. But um, there is a commonality to those things and it's those four, those four items. So th- that, that kind of was the uh, um, conceptual underpinning of, of calming technology. And it was like, okay, well, now that we know those four, we can start to look at different products and say, well, where do they violate these things? Where does this email client make me feel uh, like it's, things are unpredictable or that I've lost control or I'm being judged or I'm gonna, there's going to be some damage. To it. And that all of a sudden, it just changes the whole game. Then you can say, well, well now, now let's look at it. Well, here, what about here? What about the fact that my inbox always has this number next to it and I'm being judged about how, like what my number is, you know, like it's like 195. It's like, oh, that sounds high. You know what I mean? Um, and, and you can start to see there's a new way about these tiniest design decisions that made sense in one context, but now in this new context, they, they, they may have an effect that is, 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 is not, not ideal. So given that calming technologies are going to be playing a larger role in our digitized societies, I'm wondering if you can put your futurist hat on here and give us some insight into what you think a suite of calm, calming technologies might look like. What, for example, would a calm social network look like, do you think? Yeah. Well, what, yeah, one thing is that um, we use the phrase calming technology. There, 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 is a, there is a separate phrase, which is calm technology, which refers to something different. It refers to the notion of technology um, just presenting itself when uh, it's needed and then disappearing. Okay, so, so if you're in a car, if you're driving a car, um, it doesn't constantly tell you what the tire pressure is. But when the tire pressure is low, it just kind of like comes up and says, oh, the tire pressure is low, and then it will go away. You know, so it's just like, okay, give me information and then get out of my face, right? So, so that's calm technology. Calming technology is technology that is explicitly designed to try to reduce anxiety or create greater calm in your, in your day. And, you know, the, to answer your question about, um, you know, what do – some of the major pieces of of our 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 interactions today look like in the future uh, when they have more calming elements and you know there's there's a few right so there's there's email um, email in the future looks different it, it is I think actually G, the new Gmail is a, is a really great example of this um, you know what email used to be is a list you just were you just kind of like try to, to tread water on this list. But what the new Gmail does is it, um, it does a few things. One is that it groups things. So, so bite size, uh, ch- chunking, sorry, chunking is this practice of, of, of grouping similar things together so the brain can operate on them as one operation. And um, that's super powerful. Uh, also a list made you feel like, okay, like I need to, to act on this right now or else it's just going to add to this pile. Uh, but what Gmail did is kind of this, this different clients have done this mailbox did this, whatever, but, but there's this notion of, okay, yeah, I, I'm not going to act on this now, but I don't want to drown in it. Like bring it back tomorrow or bring it back next week or just kind of leave it here. 
but I'm not going to act on it now. So there's just like a little bit more, like if you think about a desk with a stack of papers, you, you can move stuff to the other side of the desk and say, okay, I'm not going to do this right now, but I'm going to put it here in this kind of important pile. Just like natural stuff like that people need to be able to do in order to, to not feel like robots processing information all the time. Um, and there's also, they changed actually the, 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 the emotion of, of, doing, of acting on an email, of being like delete, you know, delete, reply. Like it's, it's, a very, um, it's a very information processing mindset. A computer scientist created that and designed that. Whereas they, they created this check mark. And this check mark is, makes no sense from a computer science perspective. They have a, they have a check mark on the email. The check mark means it, it, it's based on how people feel, which is I've got a bunch of things I need to process here. And when a check mark makes me feel like good, it's like, yes, I did something. That's acknowledging humanity. That's calming. You know, that's taking the anxiety away. It's, it's kind of rewarding, right? It's acknowledging that um, I, I, I did the right thing. I did something worthy. Um, it's that kind of feeling uh, that it that it it, it uh, perpetuates. And the other example that you brought up was a social network, and um, you know that's boy, that's such a. I mean, there's there's been some attempts now at, at some different kinds of social networks. Um, you know, we 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 created something called the the calming technology design cards, which were a set of ten cards. There could be a hundred of these, but we just created ten that were simple little heuristics for you know if you didn't know how to to cr- make a certain thing more calming for people or less anxiety provoking, you could use these cards and say, well, which one of these applies right now? Um, so, for example, uh, you know, you you post something. And right now, it's just kind of like, I'm like putting myself out there, right? It's just like, okay, like I don't know what the, the crowd is going to say about it. Are they going to be evaluating me? Am I going to be, right? It's, it's very potentially, a high stress potential. Um, but if, uh, again, I'm just totally just making this up right now. But, um, you know, there, there's, a, there's a bunch of different things you can do. One is looking at how you post and how you, the actions that you take in a social network and presenting that back to you can build awareness. It can build self-awareness in how you engage with other people, which is, which is actually very reflective and can be, uh, it can move you from a mindset of being in the reactive minutia of like friending and commenting on that into like, how do I engage socially? What does that feel good for me? Um, that that's a very different mindset. Or when I post something, instead of just putting it out there to the world, uh, I'm looking for support right now. And, and I and I could I could I say that? Could I change the post to say I'm I'm looking for some support with this post and 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 that be communicated? Because you know right now if you're if you're if you're able to communicate to your friends, hey, like I, I'm actually looking through, through facial um, expressions and body, body uh, language, you can express to people like, I'm looking for support right now. I, I'm feeling a certain down or a certain way. People can read that and use it. But now through Facebook, you have no idea uh, what um, people really mean. So, but, if, but if the user can actually say, I'm looking for support, and that, then those, those social agents can use that information to, to, to comment differently. That could be a very different experience for people, and the list goes on and on. So you know these cards and these techniques, um, based on what what we understand about stress, uh, can be used to redesign existing experiences uh, to make them less anxiety provoking. And and honestly, I think this is a never ending process. Right? We're we're never going to create this perfect product that never causes any stress for anybody. Right? It's just it's always going to be learning iterating and, and growing. I mean, the first email clients, uh, they're very different than they are now. Well, some of them, uh, they acknowledge more of our human emotion. And my students have done a lot of projects around email. We actually did a whole thing with the Gmail team at Google where we were doing a bunch of experiments and it's pretty fascinating. So I like the email example, but, but yeah. So unfortunately, Nima, we've come to the end of the show. Um, where can people find out more about you and your work? Yeah, so um, if if you go to uh, 
uh, our website, we're actually offering uh, a, uh, a discount to the, the listeners of your podcast. And so if you go to spire.io slash r slash digital mindfulness, you'll get a discount uh, on Aspire there. Uh, it works with iOS devices right now. And, um, you know, we'd love to, to, to talk to your, your audience. Feel free to send us email. Um, but the, the, place would, the place to go is www.spire.io. Thank you so much for that, Nima. I'll definitely make links to that in the show notes and also to your wider body of work. But thank you for coming on the show today. It was a real pleasure listening to you. And thank you for sharing your wisdom and insights with us. Wonderful. Thank you, Lawrence, for your time. And it's been a lot of fun. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Nima Maravaji. He gave so much amazing information on how we can use technology to influence our behavior for the better. Remember, if you'd like a Spire device, go to www.spire.io forward slash r forward slash digital mindfulness for a discount there. Remember, if you like what we're doing here, please subscribe to us on iTunes or Stitcher and also to our email community where you'll get access to exclusive content that we don't share on the podcast or the website. Until next week, when we share more insights about humanizing our digital world, take care.